We're recording. I'm not even on an island today. I'm on the mainland right now. What can I say? All the more reason to move. Okay. Do we want to wait a little bit or start? I think we should get started. We're five minutes over. It's a good, good point in time. Okay. So thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate everyone taking time out of their day to join us. Um, Hillary is a board certified behavior analyst at Sendon, Univer uh, Sendon Center in Bellingham, Washington. She utilizes a skill-based treatment in a variety of settings, including schools, homes, and in a clinic. She's passionate about making the field, of, a field focused on empathy, kindness, and rapport since having her own children and realizing this disparity between real life and the treatment of problem behavior in our field. Hillary is an admin for the group and strives to bring skills to use skills-based treatment to clinicians around the world. Also, she wants to give a mad props to Ed for the visual splen splendor you're about to experience in the PowerPoints. Ed is a board certified behavior analyst at Search Day program in Ocean um, Township, New Jersey. Search is a private special education school for students with autism. He focuses on building trust, creating joy, I love that one, and teaching skills in order to eliminate severe problem behavior in a safe and televisable manner. He and his team recently presented my way using ISCA and skills-based treatment to achieve meaningful outcomes in a school setting at both Autism New Jersey 2020 and, school, and Kids First 2020 conference. He has also presented in this, group, this group's online Zoom collaborative hangouts. In August, he led a discussion titled Learning While Teaching, How the Skills-Based Treatment Can Make Us Better Shapers and Teachers. More recently, he and his team at Search collaborated with folks at Trade Winds to present Create the Wave and Ride It, bringing meaningful change to our school or agency in order to achieve significant and desired outcomes. We're also so honored to have joining us Megan Miller, D2 Rajmar, I, I swear I, I practice Rajmaran, and Emily Kearney. I do so appreciate all of you being here. So sorry, so sorry, D2. Um, and um, really, really do appreciate everyone being here. And um, yeah, I'd like to open the floor to the presentation. Thanks, Penny. Sorry, D2. <laughs> We're so happy you're here. We've oh my God, please, <laughs> please don't be sorry. <laughs> Uh, Penny and I were practicing on the phone before we started the Zoom. <laughs> uh, so we're so excited to have everyone. Does Ed, do you want to throw up the PowerPoint? I, if you have it up, I can't see it. I'm on my mobile, so it might be my fault. Let's see. So we're going to do some, something a little different today. Ed and I put together kind of a comprehensive um, PowerPoint about some of the most frequently asked questions in the group. And there's about six slides uh, that we're going to talk about. And for each slide, we invited a guest to join us in a discussion. So we have Megan Miller with us. We're so grateful you're here. Emily is with us. Emily Kearney is with us as well. And Dichu Raja Raman is here too. And we're hoping that they can help provide us with some um, excellent discussion and discourse to help you guide your practice in using SBT um, through some of these most frequently asked questions. So come with us on a deeper dive. We're so happy you're here. That's you, Ed. You're I know, next. It's, it's slow moving. <laughs> I clicked. All right, so um, when Hillary and I were first starting to put this together, I had uh, thrown this out there that even though I've used this for other uh, presentations that I think like I, I want to always have this on for every presentation I do because I think that um, these must-haves when you're talking about uh, you know the work that we're doing um, are just so important for us to remember and keep in mind. Um, you know the other stuff like the stuff that like is most focused on I think and um, unfairly so I guess or what shouldn't be focused on uh, you know the academics, vocational tasks, all that stuff will come along for the ride. But if you're coming at your uh, practice with these must-haves in mind, you're going to be a-okay. Um, and, you know, more recently, 
in a, a discussion, someone had, you know, posted like, oh, like, you know, my, my first, uh, my first ISCO was a disaster, you know, like, you know, it, it didn't work. It, we, we couldn't figure it out, well, you know, yada, yada, yada. And I said like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like my first reaction was like, you know, did you learn anything from it? You know, was it safe? Did the, did the kiddo have fun? Like all these things are yeses. So that was, just, that was a success then. So like, if you remember that and you keep that in mind, all this other stuff is gonna, you know, uh, you know fall into place. So these things that we're gonna talk about in these next few uh, slides, you know, they are issues that do come up when we're, um, when we're doing this practice. And, you know, hopefully some of the stuff that we talk about can help others, you know, in the audience when similar stuff happens to them. But if you just keep this stuff in mind, you know, these, you know, must haves, like I said, I'll, I'll keep hammering at home. You know, you're gonna be a-okay. So every presentation you're gonna see from me is gonna have this, just as in the FYI. Me too. I'm going to steal it forever. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about unreasonable mans during synthesized reinforcement. And our special guest to talk about this with me is Emily Kearney. This is this slide. Um, unfortunately, I can't zoom in on it. But this slide is so very influenced by a thread that Emily and I had about unavailable during um, SR and the problem behaviors that can result from it. So Ed and I sat down and this is, I'm going to turn this into a poster. It's my favorite slide of all time. We sat down and made this beautiful like flow chart of what to do. So as we talk about this as frequently asked questions, we tried to keep this pretty general, but if you want to think about a learner, this might apply to, it might also help you. So the first thing that you should do when you come across something that is unreasonable or maybe unavailable is is to really th sit back and think, is it actually unreasonable? Like, can it be available? Is there a way to make it available? And if the answer to that is yes, then make it happen. Make it available. Find a way. It might take some time. I know I have some families where I really have to work really hard to make some things that typically are unavailable available again because they're not harmful and it's just maybe become a habit or a ritual in the family that we need to work through and find ways that we come to a common agreement to make it happen. If the answer is no, then wait. Before saying it's really not available, really examine if it really is unavailable or if you can find a way to make it available. And if you can, make it happen. So those are the easiest ways to deal with unavailable is to try to make them available. But we know that that's not always what goes on with unreasonable mans. We oftentimes get mans that we cannot give access to. And I think one of the most frequently brought up ones in the groups is physical play or like really hardcore, like rough housing or wrestling and stuff like that. So if the answer is no, because it's unsafe, we have kind of a flow chart for you to think about how to work through that unreasonable man to try to meet some of the needs of it. So no, maybe it's unsafe, like stacking desks in order to climb and hang from a basketball hoop. This is actually an example from Ed. True I story, remember by the way. Is this true? I remember, I remember <laughs> you talking about this. So what can you do in this situation? This, clearly there's something this person is looking to do that they can't do right now. So what can you do that replicates that in a way to make it available again and sit back and think about that. There's a lot of choices here. I don't really necessarily want to go through everything, but you can make ad adaptations. You can find ways to make it available in another way. You could find out that actually it's not the climbing on the desks. It's the attention that they get from climbing on the desks and they want that if you, need, you need to put that attention in there in another way to prevent climbing on desks. Instead, um, maybe they need other things to do. Maybe that's their only leisure skill and you need to develop some other skills for them to engage in to prevent that from being a big issue. And maybe it's not safe and it will never be safe. And if that's the case and you've tried all of these other things, you've tried alternative leisure skills, you've tried a different attention, you've tried putting those pieces into your SR condition in other ways that are safe and you keep coming across this issue, you might have to come up with some behavior modification tactics to try to make this a safe available option or, some, or, or, or we'll talk about this later, maybe put some extinction in place with some alternative activities that they can do and work through some of that stuff. But that should really be your last option. And then what we put at the end of this is if you do all of that and you're still not getting there, I have a client like this, then you should contact FTF because this is what they're there for. They're there, they're the experts, they're there to help you um, to move forward and find these things and maybe 
pieces that you might not have considered or you might be missing to, to get that client HRE and get that SR condition really well set. And then I added, based on that thread between Emily and I, I added this upper level over, over here on the very top of this slide. No, it's unavailable. It will never, ever, ever be available. So I have a client who makes repeated asks for things that will never happen. Like I want it to snow in the summer, or I want you to get this bug from Africa that I think about sometimes, or I like the other day he wanted to recreate ice age and find Sid in the snow. Sid wasn't in the snow. There was no Sid in the snow. There was no way to make Sid in the snow happen. And had we even tried to play out that scene, we would have resulted in some severe R1s with that client. And so we had to, we've had to work through that with this client in very specific ways through our programming, which I just want to keep reiterating that thread with Emily, like change the game for this specific client. And making those unreasonable or unavailable mans really mean something other than problem behavior. We, we work through that in a very specific way to target the, the emotional responding that would come up when things would be unavailable. And by doing so, we eliminated that problem behavior outside of SBT. We were doing SBT, but we also added a behavior modification to it to change that little piece of it. And it has been a game changer for that client. What I would say though, is if that hadn't happened, if that hadn't worked again, I would land back at contact FTF, get some advice from the experts, get some help from the people out there who have this information, who know, who've been through it, you know, with multiple case studies, not just the one you're working on and get that additional support that you need to help your client access SCT and find that SR condition. So this is my favorite slide. I'm really excited about it. So I want to invite Emily to chat with us about unavailables and have a conversation together. Um, and I, I can't see the chat. However, I see there's a lot of things popping up. So if anyone wants to grab something out of the chat to talk about, that would be cool too. So, Emily, right. you, have, you have thoughts. You have I thoughts do. About unavailables. I always have thoughts. Um, uh, <laughs> Penny, um, I actually have a slide specifically about man compliance. So um, I assume we'll get there in this discussion today. I think when we talk about cabs, we'll get to that. Um, so gosh, there's so many things. So I want to try to keep it short. Um, I realized though that I made, um, I made a little set of slides to uh, go along with my thoughts just to keep things organized, but I would like to share them with everyone who's come today, but I didn't have the um, under the sea background. <laughs> so um, so I'll, when we're done, I'll uh, update it just a little bit or uh, put it in a different order and then um, share it with uh, Hillary and Ed so then um, maybe we can put it in the group files. Oh, that sounds great. Awesome. Um, all right. So a few things kind of moving into this. Um, one thing that uh, I wanted to just reiterate when Hillary was saying um, that two things about the lack of leisure skills. I see this so often where um, what the learner is manding for doesn't actually get them into HRE, and that's kind of a different topic, but then it sort of, in some ways, it becomes an unreasonable mand because even when you try to provide it, it's not really going to do it for the learner because um, it's something that maybe it is it's sort of what they do when they don't have something else to do, but it doesn't really satisfy them. It doesn't make them feel good. It's not HRE. So, um, so really looking at leisure skills and developing a really solid core of leisure skills rather than just trying to take the one or two activities that the learner might already engage in and use those as the reinforcer for the, the, this process, it, it's not really going to work a lot of the time. So Logan was asking, do you put put this on hold maybe and work on some of those leisure skills. So you certainly might do that or you might work on a different branch or um, a branch that maybe involves some sort of other activity and then work on developing those leisure skills concurrently. Um, the other thing then that I noticed was it's so often the instinct of adults to just say no to kids requests. Mm -hmm. We say no all the time when there really isn't any reason. We just don't feel like it. I don't want to go back in the other room and get the thing because I just came back from there. Those are not really good reasons for saying no. We're just kind of being lazy a lot of the time <laughs> and the response effort is too great. So um, I see a lot of just in everyday life and babysitting, I see so many times just typically developing kids 
ask for stuff, the parents say no, then the child engages in problem behavior and they whine and complain, and then the parent negotiates and they say yes anyway. So if you were gonna do that, why not just say yes off the bat and, and skip all that problem stuff? Um, so really helping people look at why they're saying no and if the child is not able to tolerate no's, then parents really need to say no for these various reasons that maybe aren't really good reasons, but they're going to do it anyway, then that's something we can actually address in a cap. Um, so um, I'll get to that in just a minute. But um, so one of the things that I like to practice for uh, some concurrent skills with children so that they can tolerate hearing no are being able to um, work on selecting uh, let's see, making choices between reinforcers when there's no MO in place so that, that adults can offer choices between A, B, and C, and the learner can then make one of those choices even when it wasn't their idea. Um, and then also being able to, um, when they're told no, being able to make a choice between some specific suggested alternatives. So no, we can't go to the park right now, but we could go in the backyard to play or we can go next door and use our friend's play structure. Um, when also being told no, being able to then make a free operant choice. So when I say, no, sorry, we can't go to the park, I want the learner to be like, well, how about we go to the backyard? Which they could do as a kind of a phase following making a choice between specific things. Um, and then, um, oh, sorry, that was the, the next step. The one in between then would be when they're told that something is un, unavailable or unreasonable, that they make a free operant choice from options that are presented, but not specific things. So let's say a child says to me, oh, you know, I really want to play caribou. And I know caribou is in another room being used by a client. And because it's COVID, we have to sanitize toys before they're used by another child. So it's not available. And that's just a hard no. And I say, hey, why don't you take a look around on the toy shelf and see what else you might want to play with. So I'm not giving them specific suggestions, but they're just looking and picking something. Um, and then finally, when I say no, could they just spontaneously say, well, how about we play outboxed or let's play pop up pirate. Um, so those concurrent uh, things to practice or sometimes uh, things to practice almost as not prerequisites, but maybe practice those things a little bit before um, really helps. Um, so I'm just looking at the chat for a second. We're at, we're almost on time for this slide. Okay. Um, so then we want to actually work on uh, un un unavailability being the cab. And so we want to work on having setting up an MO where it's contrived by the instructor and then it's sort of naturally occurring. And then we have the child spontaneously manning for things that should be reasonable and then maybe manning for things that are unreasonable. And we actually work through that as a cap. So the child asks for the red marker and I look at it. I'm like, oh man, this one's all dried up. It isn't really but we're making something be an unreasonable man that's not actually an unreasonable man. And then when they tolerate through whatever tab we're on, suddenly I recheck it, I test it, and I realize, oh, they're actually, you know what, I was thinking of the other red that's dried up. This one's here. Um, so it, practicing that as a cab is really important. Um, can I, jump, can I yeah. jump in and just add something that I felt sure. I've done, based on your suggestion, I use this with one of my clients. It has like change the game for him. One of the things that was really hard to, tra to train staff to do was not do my way with those cabs. That is, that is a, we, it's not a my wayable cab. <laughs> and we can talk about that a little bit later, but we, you and I talked about that a bit is that you're going to make it unavailable, but they can't my way their way back into it. It's unavailable until, until it's available again. Right. So the, the whole point, the, the whole, what they're actually tolerating is that respondent behavior perhaps that occurs when they hear that something is unavailable and their heart starts racing a little bit and they get a little sweaty and they get anxious about, oh no, I can't have this thing that I wanted. And to be able to just sit with that discomfort mm -hmm. and go on your about your day and do other activities, knowing that the thing you really wanted is not available and you move on and you don't perseverate, you don't keep asking and you do some other activities and then suddenly surprise it actually becomes available again yeah game changer 
It's my favorite thread in the group, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, do you have any other thoughts you want to share with us before we move um, to the next slide? Let's see. Just, um, uh, let's see. Sorry. Give me one second just to take a look at the, um, oh, okay. So then the other, the other thing that I wanted to mention though, is that, that, um, when we're giving some of those, this is unreasonable. It's also really important that we practice both the grown up just says no and you don't know why, and maybe it's really unfair, but you have to just tolerate it. That I do as a second stage. The first stage is the, the unreasonable man is unreasonable for a logical reason. And whenever possible, I either explain or show that to the learner. So first they tolerate it. There is no red in this box. That's because I took it out. Right, but they don't know that. Um, so there is no red, the marker is dried up, a friend is using it, we can't find the thing. So they're all not just the grown up being mean and saying no and you don't know why, but, but, but it is much easier to tolerate knowing why. Once they can do that, and we have that history of trust of, I'm, I'm going to say no because you know there's a good reason and I'm not just doing it to be arbitrary, then we can move to I'm saying no, and I'm not telling you why, and you can't see why, but you're going to trust it because so much of the time with our learners, we can't actually explain why, either because they don't have the language level to be able to understand that yet, or they do, but it's a complicated thing that only a grown up would understand, or for safety reasons, we don't have time to explain it, and we need them to just accept it and trust that. But you can build that up by first doing it with things that make sense. Um, so, okay, that's it. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. I have so many things swimming through my head and I'm gonna have to watch this recording a couple times. So <laughs> thank you so much. That's great. All right. What's the next slide? The next slide. I don't know why it's taking so slow. It's going to take so long when I click. I already clicked. I guarantee I'll click it again. It's going to go two ahead, but we'll see. This is it. Okay, good. So problem behavior during the trial. Um, we see a lot of discussion on this as well. Um, and there's going to be uh, a slide upcoming that actually deals more with extinction. But let's just, let's just say a problem behavior happens during a trial. You, really, there's three ways you can handle it, right? You can you know, acquiesce, you can live the fight another day, and, you know, hop back and send back to reinforcement. You can do a, like a brief extinction where you, you know, maybe you're keeping the demand or you're keeping them in adult led time for uh, a little bit longer. Maybe they, they complete one, two, three more responses that are appropriate and then you send them back. Or you, they were just supposed to do 12 responses. You're keeping them to do 12 responses. You're not saying, you're not acknowledging them at all. Um, you can tell by the little emojis on like the emoji scale where I would fall in on, on these. But that's going to be a, a different slide for right now after whatever you choose, you have to then analyze what is making this trial too hot for the kiddo, right? You have to think of like, you know, the next trial, what are, what's the plan? Like, what are we going to be doing? So um, on this slide, we have, you know, some of the things to, to consider. Um, one of them is unplanned EO. So you play detective. What's going on in the environment? Uh, what could possibly um, have been said or done? Um, I have a, a good example from one of my guys who, um, you know, it was, he was up to Cav 6. He was like rocking, you know, just kicking butt in, in practice. He was in the classroom. He moved from practice room to classroom. Uh, he's working with a newer staff member, but she had been with him for, you know, for a little bit. Uh, so he was back. He was up to Cav 6 with her. And she was telling me that he's getting, he's having R2s and sometimes R1s on Cav 2s, but not on any of the Cav 6s. So I'm sitting there like, what is going on with this? So we had been recording, so I was watching some of the video, and it actually didn't occur to me right away, but it turned out that on cab twos, when he would come over to the desk, she would say, all right, uh, I'll say Anthony, okay, all right, Anthony, uh, go sit down, because in her head, that was what he had to do on that, and then he, she was going to reinforce. On cab sixes, she was saying, okay, come on, Anthony, and walking over and sitting down. She wasn't saying sitting down. Sit down is one of his triggers. So it was just like, you know, we, once we realized that, then he went like weeks and weeks without any more R2s and R1s. It's like little things like that, that you have to like be so careful of and you have to really be, you know, mindful of. And that also is a great illustration of then as far as when you get into uh, working with 
someone else working in with the student, you know, you know, being able to be with them, be able to give them real time feedback, or at least be on top of them, not going, you know, more uh, several sessions without seeing, you know, actually seeing them what they're doing, because it can be small things like that can uh, get the program derailed. Um, I have on here, or we have on here, not enough time in SR, but I also thought about it later that it's also could be too much time in SR. You know, you have to be really mindful of how much time they're in synthesized reinforcement. For some guys, they need a longer amount of time to come back from that, you know, emotional difficulty that just went through on a trial. With that being said, sometimes the repetition and getting two trials quicker helps some of the students because they, uh, you know, they get into like a little bit of a rhythm with it. And not that you want to be like on a set rhythm, but you know, too much time can sometimes then lead to you know getting too much in the head. And um, so I've seen that both ways. But more often than not, I've seen in my experience, uh, R twos and R ones happen when a when a staff member is running trials too quickly, and it's, you know they're not getting enough time to get into that HRE uh, phase. Um, the quality of synthesized reinforcement. So is the student bored during this time? Are they actually getting to HRE? Uh, we have. Um, you know, talked a little bit about the unreasonable mans, uh, and then we'll also be talking about problem behavior that occurs during uh, reinforcement. But, you know, it's basically you, I, the same thing as looking at in the trial. Be really mindful of what's going on in the environment. You know, be, be really mindful of uh, when they're in reinforcement, are you available to them? You know, are they, in, are they really engaged with, with what you're giving to them? Are they looking over their shoulder in a not nice way and not like come play with me way? Are they looking over their shoulder like, are you coming back over here to deliver something that I don't want? Are you worsening? You never want to be worsening until you actually are worsening, but then that trust is built up that worsening is okay. Um, and then too hot, too fast. So response requirements, are they too high? I think that can go for, uh, for a, a couple different ways in this. Um, are you presenting a demand in adult led time that is too hard too early? So are you on like a CAV three, CAV four, doing stuff that's probably more ready for down the line. You know, if it, is it like a curriculum that, you know, student hates math, you know, for CAV 3, I probably wouldn't be introducing then, you know, uh, touch math or whatever math that they really hate. Um, and then, or is it too much? Like, are you expecting too uh, long of a time sitting in adult led time too early? So when you start to consider these things, then, you know, that can help help you as you shape your calves, as you, as you shape the trial. And if you see problem behavior during a trial, then more likely than not, it's gonna be one of these four things or a combination of these four things that you have to really look at. Uh, and then if it is something that's too hot, too fast, I always go back to the shaping. Like the shaping, I think that's like one of the most fun things in this process for me is seeing like what a student has a hard time with and then saying, okay, well, how can we make this a little bit easier for them? How can we make this a little more palatable for them? How can we, you know, get them to that next rung on the ladder in that little diagram? Because to me, like, you know, I had been practicing behavior analysis before doing this process. I knew what shaping was, but I never had as much shape, fun shaping before as I do now. So I think that's a testament to this process, but also the results. Seeing, you know, in one session, a student be able to make progress that might have taken weeks with a lot of problem behavior and a lot of just like aversive qualities to it. It just, it just takes a lot of the sting off of these things that we're trying to teach them. So it's been pretty cool. Um, you too. I know you have some thoughts on this. Do you have anything that you'd like to share for this slide? Yeah, um, I'm not able to hear myself as well. Can, uh, can y'all hear me? Okay, yep. great. Uh, thank you so much for laying this out. Um, I, I think I really appreciate the spirit of having acquiesce, get out, live to fight another day at the top. I'm, I, the way I'm reading it is it's in order of importance, whether or not that's how you designed it. That's how I'm interpreting it. Um, and I think that the spirit of it should be there, which is to say, like, rather than have a termination criteria, everybody who's involved in the process should feel empowered, uh, enabled to, to be able to shut things down at any point in time. However, as a decision tree of, of working through problem behavior uh, in the EO, I don't know that I would say that that's what you should do first every single time. And uh, whether or not that's what you were implying, I just want to... Uh, orient you all to a study that will be coming out um, in Java soon by Dr. Robin Landa, who was a, a, a former student of Dr. Greg Hanley's. You guys all know Greg. Um, that, that paper is, I think, going to be really helpful in this discussion because it was specifically about how do we respond to problem behavior when it starts to occur during thing, even something as, as 
uh, low key as FCT. Um, and the main take home point from it, which I would probably put above acquiesce, get out, live to fight another day, is that uh, uh, Dr. Landa's study showed us that if you prompt the correct response immediately following problem behavior, that it turns out it's okay. So what I mean by that is if you're like, okay, just say my way and they have problem behavior, you can say, hey, just say my way again. You can say, hey, we're just doing math homework again. Um, that prompt, sometimes we, uh, I think our big worry as, as behavior analysts is that that might result in chaining, where we're chaining problem behavior with a follow-up contingency review and then, and then appropriate behavior. But um, with, I think, four consecutive applications, we saw that that never really happened. Um, so I think that it, it really is in the spirit of working with the client, not working to the client. But essentially, the, 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 the thing is this, here's a target behavior, you missed the boat, kid, you did an inappropriate behavior instead. Let me represent the prompt to engage in the correct target behavior um, at this point in time. And I say that as something that should come before live to fight another day, because it, I think it's important to recognize that throughout the history of the SBT literature, there's, there's everything that's been published thus far has involved, I think, like full on extinction for, for problem behavior. We don't do things like that anymore. I'm not encouraging anybody here to do full extinction, physical guidance, but the, that's still something that's in our literature. It's still something that works. So if we can peel back from that and have our televisability and our trauma informed values, it's worth mentioning that that children can still experience extinction. They can experience differential reinforcement such that their R2s, you know, aren't immediately being reinforced with the full synthesized reinforcer. And, uh, and you're likely to still get the, the treatment gains that you're looking for. So I think that the acquiesce is super relevant for if you're seeing R1s uh, immediately, like you're just, you, it's too hot, too fast. You're saying, hey, let's get to work and they start banging their head. Then absolutely the R1s is one way to put out the fire, live to teach another day. When you're seeing R2s, and this is something that I'm running into in my consulting now is like, we've almost gotten to a point where we're like terrified of hearing uh, our clients just be like, no. And it's like, you know, <laughs> some people consider that a man, uh, but we're like, oh, I think there's an R2. So maybe I should just reinforce and back off and, and, and revisit. And again, my point is that, that you always have that option. That's okay. But I think before you do that, I, I encourage folks to, um, if they're seeing the R2s, prompt the correct response as you would um, and, and, and keep the EO in place, keep the EO where it's supposed to be so that you're not like, it's not like contingent lowering of expectations, uh, contingent on problem behavior. So it's, it's like you put in an EO, they have problem behavior, you just prompt them through and say, hey, actually the correct response is this. I think that's the big thing that I would add to these, to this, this, this group of three. Did you, I have that's, a follow-up question for you. Sure. So there's a couple of comments in the chat that I can't see the whole thing because I'm on my phone, but um, it, I think they're saying, should you always? So I just am wondering if you would add maybe a takeaway of, I don't know, is there a rule that you would suggest like always do this? Or would you say that there's a maybe a clinical decision-making tree that you should consider? There's a decision-making tree to consider. And uh, I, I guess I could try to articulate it. It doesn't exist. So it, it's going to involve a little bit of a, of <laughs> discretion on the part of the clinician. I think that actually, Ed, you, you, you highlight the things on the right side of the screen, the unplanned EOs, the, 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 the reactive kind of task analyzing of the problem. Those are things that you could also do on the front end, be preventative. And that's super important. That is like, rather than wait till it's too hot, too fast, it's perfect to, to, to go slow and set the expectation that where it's, it seems likely that they're gonna engage in the correct response when you put the EO in place. So those are all things that you should definitely do on the front end. Uh, don't, don't plan target behaviors that are way out of the repertoire of the, of the client's, way out of the client's repertoire, da da da. I think that as you're, as you're teaching, as you're going about it, um, you wanna provide immediate prompts so you can immediately reinforce correct behavior in your teaching trials. And as you start to maybe fade those immediate prompts because you're starting to see independence in your client, if you start to see those R2s creep up, you start to see even R1s creep up, I, I think that it's um, appropriate in line with trauma-informed care to, to uh, give a secondary prompt. Say, nope, actually, this is the correct behavior. So, so to immediately prompt after problem behavior. I would recommend that across 
uh, I would say uh, across most clients, I would recommend that until you notice that what's happening is you're seeing behavior chaining, until you notice that this is not an effective prompting strategy. Really, the way I look at it is if I'm halfway through FCT, I start to see R2s, I might give those immediate secondary prompts. That is like, oop, R2, I'm going to prompt. Actually, just say my way, please. And then what I'm thinking is on the very next trial, I'm probably going to give them an antecedent immediate prompt because what I'm learning is that, that the R2s are, are coming to strength uh, above and beyond the FCR. So what we want to do is just use the prompting and the differential reinforcement to reallocate responding to the, to the FCR as opposed to the target behavior. So I, I think, yeah, I, w I feel comfortable recommending to, to do that first. And then, you know, if it escalates, if it gets worse, then, then please reinforce so you can live to, live to teach another day. But, but I, I really support Ed's idea of at that point, when, you're, when you've done it, um, this brief extinction idea, I think is similar to what I'm talking about. It's like, oh, we're not going to reinforce that just yet. You, you still need to just say my way, please. Um, if that's resulting in an explosion, then, then absolutely it's worth really, really uh, breaking it down and seeing where things are going wrong, what, what is resulting in such a quick escalation to problem behavior. I have, Can I add? Oh, okay, oh, I have a quick question. I have a quick question real quick. Um, two questions. Uh, the first question is, I will add this to the slide and then send it to you and you can, uh, you can check it off and make sure that we're good before we put it up on, uh, on the group because I think sure. that will be really beneficial and helpful. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, when it comes to those R2s, now you're talking about for like the, say like the my way, so early on in FCT. Let's say we're, uh, it's an R2 coming in at, um, you know, you have on, designated on that trial, they're gonna do like 12 to 24 responses and then it's like at the fourth one. Is mm -hmm. that something where then you would then like prompt through to that all the way to the end? Or would you then like consider like, you know, do like the brief one in the middle? Like where would you come in on, on that? Absolutely. Yeah. So we have absolutely no data to suggest that one is definitively better than the other. So I think, Ed, what you're describing is we got 20 tasks in this cab chain. We're seeing R2s on response four or five. Do we yep. go out to the 20 or do right. we change course? Well, I, I think the important features of how to, to, make, to do clinical decision making in the moment are, uh, well, you could go either way. You could just say, actually, I'm going to prompt you through and say, actually, we're doing math homework, bud, and we're going to get all the way out to 20, and I'm going to reinforce that. You could also say, actually, we're doing math homework, bud, and then the next problem that they do, you could say, wow, thank you so much. You got right back on track. We can go back to doing things your way. T truly, we don't know which is better. What we know is that um, what we don't want to see happen over time, like the data will teach you that if, if, if we're seeing a reinforcement effect, then that suggests that the the intervention of being like, nope, you just need to do one more math problem uh, might be something that's in fact reinforcing the behavior of these R2s during the cab chain. That is, they're learning that by whining, the work is made easier or, or, or something along those lines. So that's really what you want to avoid. And, and easy ways to avoid that are to make sure that the response requirement is always un unknown, you know, unpredictable, intermittent, because then as the clinician, you kind of have the capacity to say, well, this is not our best trial. Um, I do need you to do the math homework. And then they do one or two more and you say, wow. And it's like, it's as if they never knew that you were going to go out to 20 mm -hmm. cabs. Instead, you're going out to five or six. Did that get that? I, I think asking? that does. And I think, I think the idea too, you know, it's like based on the client, based on the learner too. Like, you know, I, I have one that if they're starting to engage in, uh, starting to engage in an R2, it's it's like a 1.5 actually. Like their R2 is like, it's pretty quick to R1. Mm. But then I have several others that an R2 is maybe an R2.5, if that makes sense. You know, like you, it is just the wine or it is just like the demand for, you know, can I have the iPad? And like, you know, just saying like, no, I know, I know you want the iPad. You know, we're almost done. You know, keep going, pal. Like mm. acknowledging them, acknowledging the, their statement, but still like kind of keeping it up for a little bit. Um, so yeah, that, that's very helpful though. Cause I think that that is something that a lot of us do run into, you know, when we're, it's that uh, the un, uncharted territory. Okay. We know, yeah. we know early on in the process, we've shaped up, you know, caps three, four, and five, but like now they should be all the way down this far down, down, down the line. You know, yesterday they were doing all uh, this amount. So it's that decision-making in that trial by trial that I think is helpful. And I think that you hit it the nail on the head too, that going back after that and, you know, saying like, okay, well, how antecedent wise, are we going to make sure that this next trial, we a have a plan, but let's not even get to having to need a plan. <laughs> let's, you know, 
be able to work with them so that we don't even get to that point again. Yeah. And if I can, I know that there are some common mistakes that occur when we're, when we're out at cab six and we're starting to see problem behavior in like the cab three, whatever, in the first couple of cabs that they're doing. One very common mistake is that when we see our twos, the therapist will prompt demand. Therapist, you know, we're out in cabs and therapists will go, oh, you just need to say my way. So it's important that we're talking about the target behavior. When we say, when we say use a prompt, a secondary, whatever, an immediate prompt following an R2, that you're prompting the expected behavior in the moment. If that is an FCR, prompt the FCR. If it's to keep doing cleaning up, then, then you prompt that. Um, and, and prompting means what it means. It means you, maybe you just start with a vocal prompt. Maybe you are uh, adding a little bit of visual guidance or physical guidance, whatever it is. So that's a common mistake. And, and then the other thing I wanted to say, it was just piggybacking off something you said, Ed, it was. No, I think that that, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to remember That's okay, it. did you? We're going to have you back. You're, you're, you give us so many little gems. I can't handle it. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the reminder of how flexible this process is. I mean, I think sometimes it's really easy to be like, you know, and I love the framing of the must haves, right? Like build rapport, build trust. But, but it, when you have that foundation, you really can push past some things because you have the foundation of trust that I'm not going to ask you to do anything that you can't do. And I'm going to be here for you. So I, it, this has like been a very good reminder for me that you can do a little bit of that pushing. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I uh, you actually reminded me what I wanted to talk about, um, which is that when you build the foundation, you can work through some stuff. There's, there's a little bit of nuance here. If, you're, if the kid's supposed to be working on 20 math problems and they're, they're kind of just like grumbling after 10, and it's almost like, yeah, I, I'm not impressed with this behavior. I don't even, it might even be sub R2, 2.5, as Ed said. <laughs> uh, or it might even be an R2. Uh, historically, we just kind of, ignored that and we just you know we, we just put that on extinction like attention extinction we didn't respond to it we just kept the expectation in place i think that that uh, one could make a case for that because you might see that it just crops up a little grumble and then it goes away suggesting that those responses were kind of extinguished i think that the modern take the contemporary take the ftf take is is that that we just really should try our, our best to not ignore any behavior from, from kids, be, be it in SR or EO. And I'm, I, I, I don't, I'm not um, here to, to endorse this position 100%, but I'm saying that there's, there's something to be said about it. Even if the task is that a child is like supposed to work alone by themselves, if we just ignore their R2s, we, are, we might be, be setting the stage for some R1s and, and for things to escalate. So, Again, you're probably, you might be worried, like, I, I shouldn't respond to that because then I'm like only giving attention to the problem behavior. They've been working for five minutes. They had an R2 two minutes in and now I'm responding to it. Um, I think it's okay to respond to it. Just redirect to task by, by giving a prompt, right? Saying, oh, I just need you to do this math homework right now, bud. Um, I also think that while a child is working alone, if they're working for 20 minutes, that it's even if you want them working by themselves, that while you're training them, that you can prop in every 30 seconds again, go, hey, thanks for working by yourself over there. That's a nice little, another kind of preventative tactic to ensure that if you do come in as a consequence of their R2s and say, hey, I do need you to work, that that's not the only time that they're getting your um, attention. So it's kind of this weird thing. They're in EO, they should be working by themselves, yet I still like to recommend a little bit of non-contingent um, attention, especially, it's like the catch them while they're being good, especially while they're being cooperative to just be like, you're, you're kicking butt over there, but keep working, please. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that was a clear point, but I, I think that the main point is that we want to, I think that it's, it's good practice to try to move away from letting kids languish in their own R2-ness, because I think that that's likely to turn to R1-ness. Thank you, Ditchu. You're welcome. This is. It's always a pleasure having you. <laughs> oh, I'm not going anywhere just yet, but. <laughs> How's your clicking going, Ed? Hopefully, it's staying on here. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So you might be one. You might want to add stuff to this too, Dito. <laughs> At the end, we'll see. Okay, is this no one way. yours? Oh, this is mine. Nope. Okay, sorry. I forgot the order. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, okay. So another free, so yeah, I mean, here, we literally just talked about this with Ditchu. um, <laughs> extinction, yay or nay. Um, we lost, in a way, we can't, we can't hear Do it on you. Mute. I'm back. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Apparently I don't know how to use the computer. Um, again, Ed made this amazing PowerPoint because I am really bad with technology as clearly can be seen but i just want to give him mad props because everything you see here is amazing and this extinction graphic i'm gonna put as the group photo because it's perfect um so we we sometimes have questions about should we do extinction during sbt and now i like we just had this conversation so i feel like i'm gonna be reiterating a lot um but we ed made this really cool pyramid of like how can you decide to use extinction and you know, your, your base here is bigger. Like you're most of the time, you should not be needing to use extinction because we are micro shaping because we have good HRE because we're teaching from joy because we are looking at those antecedent uh, manipulations early on and frequently. And then if you have problem behavior in a trial, maybe you would do some brief extinction like we talked about, but you're going to go back and evaluate that really carefully and make sure that that doesn't happen again. And if it does, you're going to evaluate your data. So we're going to have to update this slide too, based on what we just talked about. But, you know, sometimes you can acquiesce to those um, R2s. Almost always you should acquiesce to R1s. But I think what I wanted to add to what Ditchie was saying is that oftentimes I will really early in the process acquiesce to those R2s um, as a way to build trust and almost extend my PFA if I have a learner who's really has really severe problem behaviors as a way to kind of shape down two really good R2s. Because if I have really solid R2s, I will never have to see an R1. And I really want to get those. And so sometimes I'm going to shape by continuing to reinforce some of those bigger R2s. Um, and then, you know, as we talked about, get out of the trial, analyze what's going on and come back, make adjustments, micro shape as you go. Some of the time you might do a little bit maybe when you're getting those r2s in your trials and you're you're ready to kind of push past like we just talked about you can acknowledge we should have just had did you do this slide <laughs> you can acknowledge you know what was going on in the trial and um you know just like you said earlier ed like hey i know you really want to have the ipad i have a client who responds really well to just some silly humor of like oh come on you can do this then he laughs and moves on so you can um and especially if things you know, you know, it's going to be okay. Or, if, you know, if just that, if you, they just need to come in contact with that step to know that it's going to be okay. I had a learner who had a really hard time transitioning away from devices and we really had to do this because there was no way that that kid was putting that iPad down without a little bit of extinction. So we did that and it has been amazing. Um, and I think another thing I wanted to talk about based on what Ditchie said is you really have to make sure that you're selecting the right shaping responses like make sure your responses are small enough and attainable enough and something something that comes up a lot in the group is like you can sometimes add steps that maybe are not specifically related to what you're going to ask them to do just to build a little bit more tolerance before asking them to do the really hard thing so you still might have to use some extinction but build some of that tolerance first so like you know you're going to ask them to put down their ipad you say okay you know pause it, set it on the table, put your hands up, touch your lap, clap your hands. Okay, now I'm going to pick it up or now you need to hand it to me. So you built in a lot of little steps to get them ready to tolerate that bigger step that you are probably going to have to push through a little bit, but the tolerance skills have kind of already been built in. Um, you can use this. So mid-trial mans, this is another really big thing that comes up is, you know, do you prompt the FCR in, in the trial? And like Ditch, you said, you can, you should just prompt the next response. Not if you've already gotten your FCR, you should probably not be re-asking them to utilize that FCR. Instead, look for that target behavior. So you're probably gonna have to put mid-trial mans on extinction. Um, and then, yeah, always be wary of those R1s. In any of this, be wary of those R1s. And when should we use full extinction? This goes back to what Emily and I were talking about with unavailables. Oftentimes when something is truly unavailable, it is going to have to be put on extinction. Um, you're gonna have to program this very specifically. You should be very mindful. And just remember, never use extinction alone. It should always be paired with something else. And when you are using extinction, I just love this graph of, um, or this graphic that Ed made on the top right. It's gonna be the group photo. When you use the extinction by itself for things that could be 
taught in other ways, you're likely leading someone down the course towards severe problem behavior, which is what we're trying to prevent. So if you are thinking that you need to use extinction for something, really be mindful of that and consider what else you could do first, or if you are going to use it, what else you need to include to make it effective and last and be um, worthwhile for your treatment. Um, and we have someone with us who is so like has pushed this field so far when it comes to using extinction and trying to use better procedures that are more humane and more effective. So I just want to be like, thank you, Dr. Miller for coming and being willing to have this conversation with us. So I just want to let you talk a little bit about um, extinction, particularly because that's something that you're very passionate about and also has fueled a lot of my passion into not using extinction as much. So well, thank you, Hillary, for that lovely introduction. And I can't tell you how exciting it's been sitting here listening to numerous people talk about um, why not to use extinction. When I first started presenting on this back in 2010-ish, there was it was me, me and Robert Schramm. That was it. <laughs> We're the only ones talking about it. Um, even the first few presentations that I saw Dr. Hanley do on some of the um, progressive things they were doing, they were still using extinction. And I was like, come on, man, what are you doing? Um, so it's been really exciting to see that shift happen and the way that FTF has been making it more packaged and like easily, easily consumed for practitioners. And then of course the Facebook page, having y'all there to answer questions and share your experiences has been um, really helpful as well. As Penny said in the chat, she said she only gave me two hours. I could probably talk about this for days. So I'll try not to take too long. Um, in terms of using extinction within the SBT process, I think you all have, have thoroughly covered a lot of the things, so I'm not going to reiterate, but I will point out a few things that have come up for me over the past year they were there when I did the challenging behavior webinar back in 2018, but they're even further developed now and I haven't really had a chance to present on it. So I'll just tell you what they are. One of the things that's really important to think about that I've noticed with some of my clients, it doesn't mean it's all of them, is um, when we're talking about whether or not a client is prepared for extinction and we talk about tolerating things. But there's a lot that goes into emotionally regulating ourselves. And I know that's weird for a behavior analyst to say, but it's real. And if COVID hasn't taught you that, I don't know where you've been. <laughs> like we have all been doing a lot of things in our lives this past year to like shift and cope and recoup and do all of the things, right? So when you look at a lot of our learners, they're not naturally developing those skills. And unfortunately, a lot of them have probably been in ABA programs that didn't give them the opportunity to develop those skills that stifled that development that extinguished that development and all of those types of things. So I have a, an almost five year old and just watching him and like the amount that with he doesn't have a diagnosis. He has typical language development, the amount of like coaching I've had to do with him to help him learn how to navigate what's going on with his body and the emotions that he has. And then I watch and we don't do that with our learners and it just makes me so sad. Um, so that's one thing that I would be really um, cautioning is making sure even when you're looking at doing SBT with like no extinction, um, what are you doing in your programming overall to, to teach those skills? Because if you have to use extinction at some level and those skills aren't present, you're not likely going to be very successful. Um, and even if you don't use extinction at all, but you're not working to teach those skills, you're probably not going to be very successful. There's some learners I've worked with where just through using shaping and keeping them in HRE, they, those things just sort of naturally happen like they would in typical development. But there's other learners I've had where they're not even, there's like the skills are just not present at all and they're not naturally going to pick those up. And we spend the bulk of our time working on you know, breathing and how to like, what thoughts we're having and how do we navigate from this to that. And I, I'm doing it with kids that barely talk. So this isn't, I think that's another um, kind of misconception is sometimes we have clients who they may not have very much vocal language. So people don't talk to them. It's these, like, I know I've said sad a few times, but it's the saddest thing to me to, to witness, especially like I've had a few who are, you know, teens 
and you know their parents were taught to sort of like shuffle the child around so you know there's a, a 13 year old girl being told to like get dressed or whatever and she's protesting and like whining and they're just sort of like shuffling her body through different motions they go shopping and she screams and they're just like come on let's go to the next thing they're not telling her where they're going they're not talking about like why she might be upset like there's no language happening at all and there's no like a typical conversation you would see between people just doesn't happen just because the learner is not initiating that conversation or like expressing vocally certain things to you doesn't mean that we should just be silent right so um and again like my my five-year-old has been my best uh teacher but he's taught me a lot about like there's things that he could communicate when he wasn't in a stressed state right like when he was first developing language and even now at almost five um so, but as soon as some stress would happen, he didn't sleep well enough. He was hungry, like whatever other EO press was in place. Like there's something going on. All of his communication skills go out the window. And the, the amount that we expect of our learners when we're pushing them through these stressful things. And then all of a sudden we're expecting these like amazing communication responses. is just ridiculous. So, um, so I think that that's, you know, important. Like when I, whenever, I was doing, I didn't do skills-based treatment with my son, but whenever I was working on like practicing stuff with him, I was right there with him and like supporting him and coaching him through modeling what language he could use, talking about like how he might feel, um, talking about like, what are some choices, doing some like talk out loud, um, problem solving, modeling, all of those types of things. So we need to think about how we're doing that with uh, our clients too. Whether you build it into your um, skills-based treatment that you kind of touched on this with um, with the prompts and things, but I'll do that like as part of um, my um, every single interaction I'm having with a client, and it's 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 totally runs counter to what we're taught with planned ignoring. And you hear the phrase like you um, you know you're not ignoring the child, you're ignoring the behavior. And I've thought about it recently, and I think if you're ignoring the behavior, you are ignoring the child because you're not being responsive to what's happening for that person in that moment at that time and helping to coach them through it. We should consider ourselves coaches, right? We're there to help someone be successful. We're not there to just like present a stressful situation and then see what happens. Um, so when I coach through, there's a lot of like reminders of like things we've been working on about helping to keep ourselves recentered. And um, it sounds kind of fluffy and not behavior analytic, but it's, you know, what a lot of adults are doing right now with ACT and those types of things, especially in this environment. So we'll have time where we practice, like, um, you know, we're set, are we centered right now? And like, we, we have a check-in on our bodies and talk about what that feels like. And this is with kids, again, who aren't even necessarily talking, we're just modeling it for them. And then during other times when they're starting to get a little bit ramped up, we stop and we say, hey, let's check in. How are we feeling right now? What are some things we can do when we're feeling anxious or whatever, whatever the th word is that the child wants to use. And then we have a list of things for them. So when we're coaching and directing them, um, you could consider within the skills based treatment process doing some of that, right? Like, um, instead of even just prompting, okay, do the next math problem, it might be like, it looks like your body's moving a lot right now. What's something we could do to help you refocus? Um, and you do that thing real quickly and then you get back to the math work. So you might be starting to tie in some prompts and responding that's associated with coping and like helping to navigate what it's like <laughs> to live as a human in this world. Um, then the last thing I'll say, because I know we don't have much time, is with the no extinction, I think when for the top of the pyramid when talking about full extinction oh my gosh hillary i was going to mention that to you and i forgot um for full extinction even even if there's like a request that can't be met i don't like ever use full extinction so if there's a request that can't be met we're modeling okay oh i know you really wanted to go to the zoo today but you know like these are the things that have to happen let's make a plan for when we can go to the zoo and then we might ignore future requests about the zoo because our history has shown if you keep talking about it, the learner gets more and more amped up. But we still have that like initial conversation like you would with anybody. <laughs> you don't just ignore it and like hope that it goes away and redirect. You have to take a few minutes, slow down, have the conversation, even if the learner's not talking back to you, but just modeling a conversation. And then you can move into 
whatever you're supposed to be doing. If they try to bring it up to, again, you can redirect them back to the task. You can even set, like we've done things like set a timer for when we can talk about it again. And that seems to help. So there's a lot of things um, that we need to be making sure that we're doing that. Like if you think about yourself and what helps you get through things, what helps you get through disappointment, all of that kind of stuff and make sure you're applying that with your learners. Um, Hillary mentioned Rye Parenting. I was going to bring that up too. I absolutely love Rye Parenting. I did not know about it when Taylor was little. Um, a friend just recently sent it to me, but it's all like, if you all look at it, it's like it's exactly the best. a lot of what um, Hanley in the, you know, FTF talk about with like observing the child. Um, you're there, like my friend, he just, we did a stereo episode on it and he was saying like, I am not my child's teacher. My child is my teacher. <laughs> she, I help her learn things, but she tells me what to teach her. Um, and it's just a very like um, child led, but also um, more of that like kind of coaching and support type thing to let the human be the human they should be and not the human the adult thinks that they want to see in front of them. Um, so I just, I really like it. It's R-I-E. R-I-E. One of my favorite things about Rye is that it really teaches you how to respond when people are engaging in emotional responding and how to acknowledge and empathize and problem solve together in a way that meets your child from, I mean, they literally teach it from day one of treating your newborn like a human being and talking to them as if you would talk to your, an adult. And it is like, it's really changed about, I think what you're talking about was talking to students who are maybe non-speaking or don't have a, a really great communication system. This has been a game changer to te teach my staff to do this because you really do meet the child where they're at and acknowledge their feelings and teach them what to do with those feelings in a real, in real time. <laughs> it's not arbitrary. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's great. Um, I actually, I'll be putting out a podcast episode because I took some of what we talked about and I'm making it a podcast. So that'll be out soon. And I've been doing that. That's like what I've spent the last few weeks on is researching a few different parenting things. And I'll be making some new content on that for this year um, that hopefully we can all just apply with our, with our learners. Um, one last thing, sorry. And then I promise I'll stop talking. I won't talk for two hours uh, with the, the full extinction that came up when you were talking Hillary, um, what, you know, one of the questions that comes up in the group a lot is like, wait, we can't, you, we, extinction, whoa, what? <laughs> and I think it's really important that we all in our responses back to people are clear about this is not normal, right? Like we, yes, you were trained on this, but our field is the only field that does this. And a lot of people think it's weird and harmful and traumatic. So drop your history <laughs> and think about like, what did you first feel like when someone told you to use extinction? Because I doubt it was, oh sure, let's do it. You know, it was probably like, what you want me to what? You know, so like we really need to think about like really pushing people on having reflections about the field has normalized these things. If you look at any other literature on parenting, um, I've been doing a lot of research with like strengths-based uh, training, like working with like foster care and like families that um, are lower income and helping them to like build more um, sort of like caring and compassionate lives for their children. Like every single other thing you'll find, they never say these things. Maybe Dr. Phil does. <laughs> sometimes, but it's not from a place of like, let's help them learn some stuff. His is more like, let's drop the hammer and, you know, um, and show them who's boss, right? So do you want to show someone who's boss or like Hillary said, do you want to really connect with someone and help them like live the best life they can live? Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> That's awesome. I, can't, I just want to jump in on, on that point and say that I've had conversations over the last few months with staff members who have told me that the stuff that they're doing on a daily basis They've never, and this, these are people who've worked at our school longer than I have, 10, 15, 20 years, that they've never felt better about what they're doing in a classroom than they are right now. And that just goes to show, I mean, this is, and this is a year and a half, two years that they're doing it. So it's a small little amount of time that they've been doing it compared to the rest. And like, they're, they're so happy with it. So it just goes to show you, how, how is it making you feel too on a daily basis? Can I make one comment too? Um, I just, uh, I wanted to, to, um, emphasize Megan's point about problem solving and that um, a lot of the learners that I work with, I put a lot of work into programming on being able to identify problems, identify solutions, 
make those solutions happen and that um, a big part of emotional regulation and coping skills involves doing that. And so um, this isn't specific to our field, but I'll see a lot of IFSPs and IEPs where the goal is that the learner will like stay calm when things don't go their way or that they'll use this, you know, five point scale to identify things or that they'll, they'll tolerate stuff. But what's missing is, well, how do you cope? How do you tolerate? You don't just be like, oh, I guess life sucks. Okay. I mean, once in a while, but most of the time you think, okay, what's the problem here? What can I do to solve it? And when you have the skills to do that, you're then able to cope with something not going so well because you're going to work on a solution. You're going to fix it. You know what to do, or you know who you can go to or what information you can get in order to solve the problem. And so many of so much of the time, our learners don't have those skills. And so there, there really isn't any option at that point besides problem behavior when you're not able to say to the teacher, so here's an example from uh, uh, an observation I did in a special education classroom. I went in and uh, the, the learner came back to his classroom and the, um, they were going to do some some class on emotions. And so they hung these posters that like just on regular paper that the teachers had drawn pictures on and they put them over the schedule and over the blackboard or the whiteboard where they didn't belong. They weren't supposed to be there and they covered up the things that were normally in the classroom. So my learner walks into the classroom, he goes up, he sees these things that are in the wrong place and don't belong and he can't see the schedule now. And so he pulls the poster down and immediately is like sent away to go sit down in his chair and he does, but he's clearly distressed. He's beginning to provoke wise, he, he doesn't talk. And so over the next five minutes, as they try to teach the lesson, he keeps going and trying to take the poster off of the schedule where it doesn't belong and eventually has some, some pretty big R1s and is just sent to the corner. They have this like rocking chair by the window. So he's sent over there to calm down. After a minute or two, he keeps trying to come back over to the class and they just are like, go to the calming chair. Nobody helped him articulate what was different in the classroom, how he felt about it, what he could do. Maybe he could ask them to move the poster. He could show them what was wrong. It, none of that happened. And so then there was like 20 minutes spent just in horrible distress. And of course, I'm not allowed to say or do anything. I have to just sit in the back of the classroom and, um, and nobody talked to him about it. And it, it was heartbreaking. So, so being able to help articulate for our learners, oh, I see you're looking a little, you know, you're looking a little confused. And this poster maybe doesn't belong here, does it? Hmm, what can we do about that? And just showing them how to do that and helping those skills will often then negate the need for that problem behavior to begin to begin with. So. That's an awesome point. I think if you have to call something the calming chair, it's probably not very calming in the moment. <laughs> That's Isn't that so sad though, Emily? Like yeah. how could have been avoided if they had just freaking talked to him and said like, hey buddy, what's up? You know, like what's going on? And that's one of the things with the right parenting, like you're, you are observant of the child and like what they could be needing or wanting. And it's like really focused on that. Um, so yeah, anyway. by, the, by the end of that observation, I was literally shaking. I was so upset at what I was seeing, but I wasn't allowed to do anything. It, it, it got worse where then he was like taking his talker, which he never used once in the observation to talk and throwing it. It's uh, anyway, <laughs> it just highlights the need for these skills. Um, yeah. Okay, so for our next slide, it is, I did click, let's see if it's going to move or not. Should be problem behavior during reinforcement. There we go. Okay. So as you can see, uh, ships are sinking, so that's not a good, oh, hold on. The cabs aren't here yet. Nope. Send them back. <laughs> I got to do my gym tan laundry still. <laughs> um, all right. So problem behavior during reinforcement, uh, you know, so there's no EO in place. The client is still engaging in problem behavior during the SR. Um, you know, one thing before getting into all this, I just like jot a couple things down. I think most of everyone knows this already, but, you know, during this time, it's not time to sit back and like take data or sit and, you know, talk to, you know, colleagues or, you know, start your training. I mean, you can kind of do like minor little things for training or show someone something, but like, this is the time that you're, 
if you're doing anything, it's you're learning from your learner, right? You're, you're watching them, you're seeing how can you A, improve the situation, or B, if things aren't like the best, how can you make them the best? Like, you wanna be in tune with them. Um, and I, have, I wrote down here, sometimes the biggest pro progress and success comes from SR time and not during trials. So what do I mean by that? It's, you know, you see it all the time that, uh, you know, when you tell a staff member, if you're working with a, a, a student for, you know, the first time, sometimes the hardest thing to do is sit and just hang out with them. You, know, you, you it, it takes a little bit of, uh, it takes a lot of paying attention, but it also takes, you know, patience on your end. And I think that, you know, in, you know, in our day-to-day, -day, you know, practice, it's a lot of, you're trying to make sure you have data, you're trying to make sure you're on schedule, you're trying to do a lot of things, you're thinking about a lot of stuff. Can you quiet your mind and say like, okay, I'm going to be with this individual, this other human being that's next to me. Can I be with them and give them all of my attention? So that's like how you set the stage, I think, for a good uh, synthesized reinforcement is making sure that you are a part of it with them. Um, so problem behavior is happening. You're, you're, you're already doing that, but problem behavior is still occurring. Things to consider, setting events, so what's going on, uh, you know, right prior. Uh, really looking at the environment, see what's going on, see if there's anything changing. Uh, you know, running down this entire list, I don't have to read through them. It's, you know, paying attention, and then once you see something, it's having a plan of how you can fix it. So a couple of examples that I can just give, like, real quick are, I think that the, one of the biggest issues that I see during synthesized reinforcement is divided attention when divided attention wasn't something that was a part of the student's, you know, plan. Um, and just recently, I was reminded of this, and it, it came about, you know, this, I was working with, this is individual, like me working, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the student. This is now the fifth or sixth kid where it's like my student that I get to like work with most of the time, which is cool. We have a team approach for a lot of our students, but this is like my guy, one of my guys, you know, and um, my sessions that I was having with one-on-one -on -one, uh, due to COVID were still happening in the classroom because we don't have the amount of space that we did prior to all this stuff happening as far as COVID. So he's starting to engage and he has like these R2 behaviors where he like will laugh and be hitting his head, but he, it doesn't mean he's happy and he's doing to let you know that like he's, again, he's a little PO'd about something. I could not, I was racking my brain trying to figure out what was going on in like in the room that he was still through the first 10 sessions. I couldn't, I was manipulating a, a ton of stuff. The one session that I had where there was no one else in the room, zero, <laughs> zero of these. So it, you know, we had already started off prior to COVID that most of our cases, we started off in like the practice room by ourselves. But then, you know, over the course of the last few months, we had separated and we had moved into more of like in classroom, setting up mats, you know, trying to keep it uh, isolated, but still with other people in the room. This student, you know, he's had these behaviors for so long. And it turns out that whether it's the noise in the room, whether it's the idea that his teacher who's right over there might come over and she's a sign of worsening, whatever it is, we then tested this over the next like three or four days where when we would run sessions, we'd have people come in the room immediately start to hit his head. So that's okay. It's like you learn something and you know, like, well, he's not ready to do practice yet in the classroom with a bunch of other people there, which is awesome. Cause now uh, going up to the last week of, uh, uh, before our break, we had zero R twos throughout or R ones. We had zero problem behavior through every session because we had it, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. So, very, just very cool to see. The other example that I have is my, my girl, I, I call her Evie, in several of our presentations, both on here and then for Autism New Jersey, if you saw that, she is the one that has like these trigger words that if she hears sit down, if she hears any kind of like down, sit down, slow down, quiet down, it, these certain trigger words, shh, stuff like that, that had built up in her, in her rapport, in her history that caused her extreme anxiety. She can go from, she skips R2 and goes right to R1, at least before this uh, treatment. Uh, so she's not there. She's, she's done so amazing. She was the qu quickest through this process. Once we were able to kind of figure out uh, some of the nitty gritty of her program, we ended up having her have a, a tolerance response down in cab six, where we'd introduce trigger words. We got her out of the practice room and into the classroom um, and she's rocking it out. But then, you know, during reinforcement, when you're in the classroom, you'd be surprised how many times during a day, during, during uh, a session, uh, how many times someone in the classroom says the word down. Go to any classroom there on a morning and sit there and just listen. So she's hearing it all day long. So she doesn't go right to the R1, but she started to do the you know, bang on the table when she started to get upset. Um, 
So we're not gonna be able to cleanse the environment. We can tell people, you know, that was the, the usual thing for her was before, before this treatment, you know, it was like when someone came in the room, like, don't say down, don't say this, don't say that. We try to tell people to be mindful of it, especially around her. But at, we're at the point now, actually, we're at the point now where you don't even really have to because she's actually clean through this. She's, she's good with hearing down. But if someone said the word and she would get upset, we'd turn and say, you know, I'm, Evie, I'm really sorry. That wasn't my plan. I didn't have them say that. I'm really sorry. We're not doing that game with them right now. It would stop it immediately. Just looking at and acknowledging that it happened and not ignoring it and not ignoring her and saying like, you know, I'm with you. I hear you. I didn't, I didn't want her to say it. I, you know, they're not going to say it anymore right now. And then say like, can you please not say that? I, I, I don't know whether it was the treatment itself or us starting to do that. What part of it led to then her not caring as much about it. But now like we started to like try to gray the black and white. We stopped even doing it because it, it was uh, doing a part of the treatment that she didn't need anymore. Like I'd, I'd walk over and say, like, okay, uh, you know, Jake, go sit down. You, you go sit down while she's in reinforcement. She was not listening at all during trials. Didn't care at all. So I guess I went off on a little tangent on my, my girl Evie, but just, it's just remember that during reinforcement, you know, there are certain things you should be paying attention to that you normally wouldn't be, uh, that prior to this process, maybe you wouldn't have been. D2? Uh, super well said. I, I honestly uh, think that where you started on this slide, talking about the um, you shouldn't just sit back during reinforcement, I, I think that that point kind of can carry this whole slide. It's, it's a really big paradigm shift. I know it was for me, um, my, the first place where I really cut my teeth in ABA was like a residential school for kids with autism. And it, it was a cultural thing that kids would earn their trade in and it was their time to go be alone and, and your time to collect the data, your time to like check your phone. I don't know. And it was, it, you know, it, it absolutely became a, a cultural thing. It permeates other situations. Maybe it's a little bit different if you're in the home and you're one-on-one, -on -one, but I feel as though a lot of the problems that come from problem behavior during reinforcement uh, are the result of us just like not engaging with our, our clients as much as we perhaps should so so I think that that's that's so important. Uh, if you're giving your undivided attention, you are necessarily attending more to the child's behavior to be able to pick up on those signs of what are those accidental EOs that you might be able to um, kind of uh, avoid or, or reprogram or you know rearrange. Um, one of the you know some of the some of the common air times during reinforcement wherein problem behavior occurs is like when kids are maybe making unreasonable mans or when they're asking about stuff where you're not prepared to give the complete open and honest answer you know they're like well when when's mom coming when when are we going home and and i notice a little bit of awkwardness where it's like okay I'm, I'm giving undivided attention we're both coloring together but you asked a question for which i'm worried that if i say mom's not coming till three that that might evoke problem behavior so i'm going to do this thing where i'm like you have my attention we're coloring right now coloring is so fun i'm gonna essentially gaslight you into 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 into, into hre which, um, which is, I think that is a, it's an area in where we have some room for growth and room for improvement. And I, I think it's a similar recommendation that I gave two slides ago, which is just answer the question, just attend to the child, no matter what they're saying, don't be, I, I think nine times out of 10, when kids engage in the early perseveration, where we're like, oh shoot, this is the thing that's going to lead to a meltdown, that it is our reaction that dictates their next um, their next move. And if we can just sit and empathize with them or sit and just be like, I know, right? School is such a long day. Um, but truly be, Ed, as you said, I think you said, be present, be present without judgment, just be present and, and engage with children. It's a really good way to mitigate problem behavior occurring to reinforcement. It's, it's sort of like an antidote to all the other accidental EOs that, that may occur. Um, all that said, another one that's like a common thing is just like when Wi-Fi cuts out or something. And that's just, it's tough stuff. But uh, again, the, the main take, out, take home point is if we can be empathetic and we can show that we're working with our clients, like, man, I'm going to try to get this Wi-Fi up and running. But um, the good news is we have these 10 other things that we can work, like hang out, play with in case we can't get the Wi-Fi up. But you better believe that for this period of minute and a half or whatever it is that I'm going to do my damnness to, to make sure that I'm, I'm going the extra mile uh, for you. Awesome. So, so yeah, I, I think that, I think that like the, the cultural shift, it, it's not just the people in this zoom 
are probably cool with the idea that reinforcement should be undivided attention. It's training our techs, it's training our co colleague BCBAs to, to, to say like, listen, I know that you have so much data to collect, but we have to rearrange our, our uh, environment, their environment in by, by, by extension hours. That's awesome. I think that to add to that, you, um, with a lot of, in my experience, with a lot of the learners I worked with, I found the stuff, I found more things that they were really interested in that didn't show up on the initial interviews, right? Like, because, you know, during that time, it's like, you start to realize like, oh, like actually they, just because they haven't communicated, they wanted to hang out close to other people in their class before. Once I started doing this, you know, I had a student who wanted me to sit on the mat with him. And then one day just wanted me to hold his hand. Now this is when we designed his ISCA. It was, if you get close to him, that's an EO. It just shows you like the shift, like it just totally turned around because of, Absolutely. you know, once you were assigned to him that like, yeah, you're chill and not only chill, you want to hang with him and he wants to hang with you too. Like simple as that. It's like, it's, again, being a human. <laughs> yeah. Ed, that's a, that's a really great point. You might get a, a client for whom social avoidance is part of the reinforcer seemingly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think of that as, as finite. Uh, that's like one of those reinforcers that when we identified in the ISCA, the PFA process, we're like, okay, we'll start here. We're out. You can, I'll teach you demand and I will get, I will get right out of this room if I need to. But I, 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 I find that more often than not it's features. It, it's the condition diversive stimulus. That's the problem. It's like, I signal that I'm going to be unreliable when you mm -hmm. manned, like whatever, I'm going to maybe interrupt your way of playing. So that's a totally a sign that like, okay, we can start at this place of social avoidance in, in the, in the synthesized reinforcer, but we need to uh, retool that relationship so that there's a little bit of approach and love there. And that can happen uh, as you're saying, Ed, by, by just working through the, the, the SR and making sure that you're always available um, no matter what. Peel away the layers of the onion, right? Yeah. I was just watching Shrek the other day. So <laughs> that is very topical for me. Is it cool if I move on to the next slide? Are we good? You think? Okay. Oh boy. The calves are here. Here we go. <laughs> can you do it in your accent? I can't do accents. I, I can't do that accent. I'm from New Jersey, but I can't do that accent. Calves are here. I can't. I'm not even going to try. It's embarrassing. I can dress up like that though, as people saw. Me. <laughs> yes, you can. Um, I'm excited about this slide again, Emily, you inspire me to do these things because we talk about this all the time and we have been planning a hangout specifically to talk about this. So today is going to be somewhat a brief overview, but Emily and I talk often about like get, getting away from, or not even necessarily getting away from, but in like really being creative in how you design cabs because a cab is very convenient when it is, you know, come on, bud, let's go work at the table and do 32 math problems. But, you know, in real time, when you're working with kids and families, that's not the only place where problem behavior lives. And so there's all these other areas you can design really fun and creative cabs to treat really specific things um, through this process. So I kind of put this into four different categories. I talked about, I have on here, you know, cabs based on time. Um, so there are some things that you cannot necessarily measure based on responses. So for example, masks, um, certain noise, there was a thread recently, I think um, Penny actually posted it about how do you desensitize to noise to this process, um, altering some aspects of SR. So we talked about earlier Wi-Fi or, you know, maybe a, I have a client who plugs in like 45 devices and if he can't find one plug, it's the end of the world. So we have a cab for that. It's based on time. Um, spontaneous requests that come up that maybe you cannot give an, a guess to in the moment, but you will be able to. So you're going to treat that through a cab, gameplay, etc. So the way I have designed this, and I'm really curious to hear what Emily has to say, but when I design this on time, it's based on a, an interval that increases over time. So initially, my variable interval for cab 1A, for example, would be one to five seconds. So anywhere in that one to five seconds, if I reinforce, that's my cab 1A. And I go on like, you know, five to 10, it depends on the learner, right? But five to 10 seconds, 10 to 15 seconds, you know, those are my cab levels. And I reinforce at any point in that time period, as long as they're engaged in whatever my contingency is that they have to be doing during that time. And that could be 
almost anything, right? Like as long as it's appropriate. Um, sometimes it's just continued HRE. <laughs> sometimes it's, I've altered this aspect of your SR. I want to see if you can handle it and still be happy, relaxed, and engaged. And when we can meet that, we're going to reinforce, right? And sometimes it's, you know, maybe we're going to wear a mask and do something else. So you might have to combine things. Another way I design branches is based on responding as we've all learned. So specific, you know, one response, two responses, academics, adaptive skills, there's you chores. I'm sure everyone's very familiar with this. I think one of the biggest considerations um, that I run into at work all the time is like inner observer agreement of what is a response, right? So is a response what reading a word or reading a sentence? Is it doing the whole math problem or is it doing part of the math problem? And that is going to vary learner by learner based on what their toleration skills are in the part where you at, are at in the process. And so just making sure that you have that really well defined as you work through this so that you and your team are on the same page. And then there's kind of two other ways I, I run cabs. I run cabs in SR where we don't ask the learner to leave their synthesized reinforcement contingency. Instead, we change something in SR. Something's altered, removed, disrupted, or added. Um, I think playing a game might be a good example of this. Um, you're in SR, they're maybe already playing a game and you join them in the game. Or I have a client who loves to listen to Christmas music, but he doesn't want anyone to sing with him. He doesn't want anyone, let me tell you, if you've heard Frosty the Snowman 45 times in a row, it is very hard not to sing. And he gets very upset. So we actually run a cab where if someone accidentally sings, he can tolerate that and ask for them to stop using whatever language he uses. And then sometimes we deny that because sometimes in real life, people are gonna sing Frosty the Snowman, even if you don't like it. Um, and that's a cab based on time usually. And then another one, the last is when we're asking them to leave SR, you know, you're going to have to give up the stuff that you love and the things that you're doing right now and leave this area, put away these things, whatever your setup is, is going to, you're going to have to get away from it in some way, go to a new environment or transition to something else that's not a part of your current context. So I like to think about, you know, how creative you can be with these cabs and some of my favorite examples like is noise. Um, so Penny, you had that thread. One of my clients um, has pretty severe R1s when a fire alarm goes off. And so we did cabs around noise desensitization, not with fire alarms, but with lots of other noises that were not as severely respondent. Um, and that actually treated the behaviors around the fire alarm because he learned to tolerate unexpected noises. So that's just, I'm trying to be quick because I know we're running out of time, but those are some of the we're out of time, but those are some of the cabs, <laughs> uh, different ways you can grab uh, or make cabs. But when you're in, when you're in doubt, we've talked about this a lot. When you're in doubt, shape the heck out of the smallest possible steps that you possibly can, right? The smaller, the better, especially if you're hitting problems or maybe you're having a point where you maybe are using more extinction, take a step back and think, can I break this down smaller? Is there something else I can do to make this just a little bit easier for the learner to attain? Emily, do you have thoughts? I know you have you have an hour and a half of thoughts, but do you have any short thoughts on this that you could share with us? <laughs> yeah, like oh, I'm like Megan. I could talk for three hours about this. Um, and my daughter has been just uh, joining in with the. Um, she's talking the whole time. <laughs> <Not really. laughs> uh, yeah, when she sees people on the screen, but she can't hear because I have a headphone on. She just is like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway. Um, so. Um, so I just thought today, uh, just obviously we don't have very much time. So I just wanted to give a couple of examples of different types of cabs and they kind of fit along with yours, but these are some specific examples, um, all of which I've used with learners before and that don't fit the traditional FTF workbook. So they're often tricky for people to figure out how to program for. Um, and then we can go into depth when we have our hangout just about cabs. Um, so my number one is uh, things being unavailable. So we talked about that a little bit more, but I have this really broken down. So um, when we do the other presentation and when I share the slides, then there's uh, really specific phases for um, how I would do it. Um, second one is, uh, goes along with Penny's uh, question, is adult compliance with NANCE. Um, 
So this is a really important one to work on. A lot of learners come to us um, with, if you give a mouse a cookie type of situations, because it's not the cookie that's reinforcing. It's the, oh, you did what I said. Okay, let me try that again. Actually, this is the wrong kind of cookie. I wanted a chocolate chip cookie. And then you bring them a chocolate chip cookie and it's the wrong size. So then you bring them one that's the smaller size, but there isn't any milk and it just goes on and on. Um, so I have used this um, very successfully with learners but it takes a lot of careful programming because you're going to do everything in the moment and you're really going to contrive the heck out of the MOs so that you can ensure that you can reinforce whatever their request is. So you don't want to build in opportunities for unreasonable mans because then you can't practice them doing the steps and tolerating and then you can't actually reinforce what they ask for. So um, one thing that I do a lot of, which isn't, a, it's not an official step, so I'm not even sure what to call it, but I, I create an MO by giving the learner a choice to something that then I'm going to say no to, so that I'm not waiting for naturally occurring demands to happen. I'm giving the learner the opportunity to man for a lot of things so that then I can say no. So for example, if we're playing a game, oh, you know, go ahead and pick, pick a pawn, and they pick the red one. Oh, you know what? I already promised Ed that we would that he could use the red one. So things like that, where it's totally natural um, about how we're playing or however we're engaging in the activity, and then whatever this whatever cab we're on, um, you then have to look for okay, if we're doing one to three trials across one to three activities we're playing the game. We're not leaving and going to do something else and we're not doing three different activities. So I have to think about then how, what could I ask them to do that fits in with exactly what we're doing in the moment with the game. So that those are the things that they're doing before I say, hey, Ed, do you mind if, you know, George uses the red and you say, no, it's fine. He can have the red. I'm like, all right, great. Here you go. But we didn't stop playing the game. And so when I'm doing this particular cab, somebody stopping in to do an observation should have no idea that I'm doing SPT. They should just think we're playing the game because everything looks natural. Um, so um, another one is, and this is similar with compliance with NANS, but somebody who likes to make all the decisions about um, what table we use and what game we play and where we sit and all those kind of things. So that's another one. Um, then uh, another one would be um, kids who like to fix the environment who find it very distressing when something is out of order or out of place. So for example, I had a learner who noticed things like somebody had hung up a poster and they'd taken the poster down, but they left a little bit of tape on the wall. Or the drawer is pushed back in, but not quite, just a little bit still sticking out. All those things, nobody else notices. But this learner notices and will run across the room and step on his friend and knock over a toy to push the drawer in that last quarter inch because it's that important to him. Um, and so that's one where we need people to be able to man for those things instead of just engaging in what's essentially problem behavior to go do them and then teaching them to pause and tolerate not being able to do it yet, but then still doing it and really in, um, in these situations, really respecting how, how important those things are to those learners and that they shouldn't just stop noticing those things or stop being bothered by them because we all have things like that, but being able to notice a piece of tape that's still stuck on the wall, but be able to finish playing your game with your friends and then take it off the wall a little, you know, when you're done with the game. Um, another one, which is kind of similar is just making the environment just so. So, uh, Things like I have a learner who, when he uses this certain type of cup from Ikea, the wa he needs to roof it. We need to get the water all the way to the top or he can't drink. But if it's another kind of cup, it's fine. So there's a lot of things like that where for this particular thing, I like it just this way. And I might not be able to communicate that yet officially, but I will engage in problem behavior when you try to give me that cup and it's not filled all the way up. So, um, so that's a really important one to practice so that you have, I can't remember who, who described it this way, but you need a little bit of breathing room that the learner can say, hey, there's a problem. And everyone can take a deep breath, even if we're not sure what it is in the moment. And, and they know that we'll help them figure out what it is. Um, uh, so then I have just a couple more. Um, divided attention is definitely a big one. And there are a lot of ways that we can really systematically program for this. 
so that we don't end up having to use extinction or have it have it broken down where we're really in control of the situation. And I think that's something, um, same thing with desensitization. I think that's kind of the, I know we need to stop now. So that would kind of be my main point with all of these things is that it's really important to teach the staff how to contrive situations in which these mans would be important to the learner so that we can really ensure that we can do the process correctly and that they happen at a high enough rate. Um, sometimes when programming has not gone well for my learners, it's because the staff are waiting for these things to naturally occur and then trying to do the SBT process, but they don't happen frequently enough or they happen in ways that normally would be fine, only today the staff is unable to reinforce because X, Y, and Z. And so then it becomes an unreasonable man. And so now maybe half the man's the learner is going to do are unreasonable. Well, then we need to make sure that we're making a lot more opportunities for man that we can reinforce. So really having a, a, a target a number isn't right. You can't say that, but you have to have frequent enough natural naturally appearing <laughs> opportunities so that the, the percentage of times that we can reinforce are very, very high and the unreasonable mans go, go down. Um, and so in all these situations, we do things like pretend to get phone calls as the first step of divided attention. And I'm not even answering, it's not a real phone call, I'm just taking the phone out of my pocket. And as soon as the learner does the FCI, I put the phone away. Then maybe I look at the screen, right? And, and going along with that, um, wanting to make it more natural is making sure that our the language we're using as we do these things goes along with that. So what do I normally do if I get a phone call from somebody or I have a text? And I'm going to do that too. So like, ah, oh no, that's a spam call, right? Oh, it's my mom, but I'll answer it later. So, so we're really kind of talking out loud about the different reasons we might be choosing to not divide our attention and it's not um, so that when they're no longer needing to do things like the FCR, they can see, oh, you know what, this happens, this happens fairly often naturally. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is um, for desensitization, that takes quite, uh, quite a bit of careful programming, um, uh, including kind of changing the way that you do the cabs so that the initial cabs like one through five would be FCR to either stop or avoid and working on problem solving there. And then only once we get to the under challenging conditions, we get to more of now we're not going to avoid it or we're not going to stop it. But, but moving through those so that the learner has no problem saying, hey, it's too loud in here. I'm going to turn the volume down before I say the volume knob is broken, or I need, I need this volume for, because I need to hear the next phone number he's going to say, then we can turn it down and that kind of thing. Um, and, oh, no, I forgot one thing about that. Um, no, no. You're stuck. Stay, you stay tuned for Emily because she's going to be doing a, a full hangout with us soon on this very topic. We've been planning it for a while. We just need to get a date set. And I'm very excited because she has so many great ideas to share. And it, your attention to the naturalistic qualities of these um, is just very inspiring to me. So thank you for sharing. <laughs> okay, so my laptop is about to die. So I'm gonna try to plug this in really quick. So I'll just go right to Megan, if you don't mind Megan. Um, but one thing I'll just say as far as this, that at our school, we actually started to do telehealth for this process with Parents, uh, the, the SBT in the home, I had to bring them in for some training, not, not just some training, for about a month or so of running sessions on campus, as well as now that I, uh, we're not able to travel to, across campus to different buildings uh, with uh, teaching assistants and teachers in their classroom. Um, you know, I'll be, I'll be sitting on my computer watching and observing. So this screen that I had set up, I actually was doing this the other day uh, with a, a staff member as we were running practice. So. Um, but the number one thing that I found is this, that initial, uh, can they hang out in reinforcement coaching during that part? Because that seems to be, especially for parents, one of the hardest, hardest things to learn during this process. So Megan, if you don't mind, I'm gonna go plug this in so we don't lose the PowerPoint. I feel like everyone who's on here probably has more experience with this than me. Um, I do telehealth, but I don't um, have a whole lot of clients right now. So 
I don't really have much to add to what's on the slide. Um, I think Ed's point about making sure they can really hang out in HRE is important. Um, and really, whether you're doing telehealth or not, it, the same idea around just getting everybody on that page regarding the importance of taking it slow and not trying to rush through things. Um, for me with the telehealth piece and being able to coach someone through Bluetooth, I think it almost makes the process easier because you have like a bug in the ear, um, especially if they're wearing headphones and you're watching and they don't even have to know that you're watching and you can give, you can talk about stuff like right then and there. Um, especially if they're trying to, to progress an EO and they, they need to like go into reinforcement or do something different. Um, you can just tell them that <laughs> without the kid even hearing you. So um, I think I don't, I don't really have much to say about this one. I feel bad, but I don't know, um, Emily or Celia, I know you've done a lot with telehealth on this um, or any, anyone else that's on wants to say, obviously, um, that you <laughs> would have a ton to say, I'm sure too. So I, I feel bad. It's, it's a rare moment where Megan has not much to say. Don't feel I, bad. I enjoy the, uh, the telehealth aspect in the sense that, you know, you can, even for the asynchronous um, feedback, it's great to be able to watch a video of your supervisee or your therapist um, and then have a debrief about it. Because I think that sometimes when we don't have these asynchronous or videotapes, the moment is gone. And it's really difficult for someone to say, uh, wait a minute, I did that. That's what I did. But when they see themselves in the video, it's like, oh my God, I totally did that. I got it, you know, and um, that helps a lot. I, I think it makes it easier in, in that regard. Yeah, I'm doing um, all telehealth right now because um, my, my daughter is stuck under the chair um, because my <laughs> family members with health conditions that mean I have to be extra cautious. So, um, so I'm working from home all the time. I haven't been to the clinic since March. So uh, I would say the hardest thing about doing this via telehealth is my inability to directly model. And that's true for all my practice, whether I'm doing the SPT or the PFA or not. It's, I'm a very, very hands-on on the floor of BCBA. And so to not be able to jump in and show them like exactly how to hand over the cups to whatever, you know, teach the skill it has been hard. Um, but I do really like the, the um, lowered reactivity. I like um, being able to have the um, record the PFAs. And then watch them. So I did one where with another BCBA recently that I was supporting. And so she was the implementer and I was watching, but then we also recorded it and we took data concurrently. She used the app and I just used the, the workbook on my iPad. Um, but then she was able, we did it two sessions and she was able to go back and watch the recording. And then we ran some, we, we changed some of the aspects of the EO and the SR condition the second time based on what she saw the first time. And it really helped to be like, oh, okay, see, see what he was doing there. Sometimes we miss these little, um, just little aspects of either how you implemented something or how the learner reacted and when you're watching it, um, you, you get it. It's also um, really nice sometimes to have the, um, a view of the learner that's a different perspective. So depending on where we've set up the video camera, I can really look at their face. I can see where they're looking and what they're paying attention to in a way that someone who's not staring up at them is able to see. Um, and so that's been really helpful as well. Um, yeah, um, I, I just say, the, I think one of the things that makes it the easiest is just trying to do, um, do as many uh, assessments as possible through telehealth so that you figure out how to make adaptations and what to adjust so that then the whole thing just becomes um, more flexible and easier. Um, so I've been doing uh, I learned that got training on the SORF um, earlier this year, and thanks to Megan, and, um, and I've been doing that with different clients as well. So you really learn how to do these kind of in the moment, bug in the air coaching, um, and that's been very effective. Does anyone else want to add anything? I hate telehealth, so I will, I will own that. 
I look very, very much forward to being able to go back in person and do a lot of what I do um, in person. But there's a bunch of it that I would continue to do as telehealth when I don't have to. And I'm kicking myself as to why I didn't do it before, especially anything involving parents. And at yeah. home, I have a lot more buy-in and a lot of direct parent coaching sessions where the parents are acting as proxy therapists, doing a great job. And before they weren't involved at that level at all. Um, and then same thing for the ability to generalize the effects of the SBT process. That's one thing too, that's been really helpful where I've been able to get parents implementing whatever steps we're on fairly easily through telehealth, whereas before we would have waited. Um, so. I would add one thing too, that I appreciate this process now, even though we're just getting started with doing skill-based treatment in telehealth, you know, something that's been eye-opening for me going back to the whole idea of like just teaching and coaching for during reinforcement is that, you know, for any type of you know, like in-home, we're not going in-home now, but for any type of uh, parent questions, like that's usually now like my go-to is like, if they're saying they're having a difficult time with this, then kind of coaching and giving suggestions that, you know, getting, first of all, getting more of the information, but then saying like, well, can we, your homework is going to be basically, can you take 10, 15 minutes, a little bit like the, the balance approach, you know, really, can, can you, can you hang? Can you, can you hang with the kid a little more? Because I think that the feedback that I've got, I think the feedback that I've gotten so far when we talk about this with parents is that uh, it's been eye opening to them. Like I've had a parent say to me that they must always, this is them talking quote, they must always think that, uh, that I'm telling them to do something. They must always think because then once they started doing these like little hangouts, they're like, the kid wanted to chill with them. The kid wanted, so it's like the same thing that we find out during our, you know, during our treatment process, the parents are experiencing that and just think like if that's your life like so like this is this isn't just like treatment they're not coming to school and we're doing this this is like they're with their children all the time and to have that effect on them to be able them to be able to see that i think that that i'm appreciative of telehealth because i wouldn't have uh made that like leap so quickly i think and so it's been eye-opening for me also we'll sorry to... I, i'm sorry my internet or my computer died and we lost the powerpoint for a little bit We'll have to have a telehealth hangout because this is a great conversation. I think one, one last thing that I would say too that's also a benefit for telehealth, especially when we're looking at home, is that um, I can now really see what the learner's life looks like when they're not at the clinic, when we don't have control over everything. And to see, um, for example, one of my learners is at home right now um, he's five, but he's got a three-year-old brother and a seven-year-old sister. This three-year-old would have been in preschool, but is not. And the seven-year-old would have been in school, but is doing homeschooling. And mom has both of them plus my learner. And there is something going on at all times. The dog is barking, the TV is on, the little kid is bringing his truck to the table to show mom. And so, um, you have to program for all skills, but especially for this type of thing, very differently if that's the conditions that the learner is working under versus we're in the clinic and we have total control over what's in this room and who comes out and everything. And so um, it has, it teaches us to be much more flexible, but also to incorporate all of those elements into what we're doing so that we can have much more realistic expectations for the family and what they're able to do and what is meaningful for them versus, well, he can do this thing in the clinic, so great, let's teach that, but they're working under very different conditions at home, and so we would pick very different targets to work on um, based on that. It's an excellent point. Uh, this is a little bit off topic, but can I be a jargon jerk just for like one quick second? Do it. Just as it relates to the uh, cabs slide, when you mentioned that there are cabs that are time-based, I uh, am not at all disagreeing with the notion that there are some where the response requirement is just a duration-based thing. But I think it's important as therapists to, to frame it as behavior-based still. It's still contingency-based, still performance-based. When you say the EO is mask, there's still an expected behavior of putting on a mask and, and the what the requirement to meet the contingency might be a duration based thing. And the reason, the only reason I'm, 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 I'm picking on that is just because oftentimes uh, when we're problem solving or troubleshooting kids that are in uh, a cab chain and we're noticing that there's something falling apart there, 
uh, and it happens to be a time-based thing, one of our quickest and easiest recommendations is let's insert some sort of behavior. Let's, let's insert an A, a DRA, that, might, that, that is promptable and reinforceable so that if we, if we are just trying to have this child tolerate a loud noise, if that's not working, we want them to experience success in smaller, smaller increments. So we might play that noise and then ask them to, to put their hands on the table. So I don't think it's a, re, it's a really reimagining what, how, you, how you framed it, Hillary, but I think it's really helpful in cab chaining to think about the B, the contextually appropriate behavior part of it, and that, we, that we're always trying to encourage some type of adaptive uh, behavior. That's such a good point. And this is one of the most frequently asked questions right in the group about how to build cabs and people always ask about time. So do you have a recommendation of what jargon should be used that we should say? <laughs> yeah, so one time we were, I was goofing around and we called them, it's still within cabs, but rather than, you know, quantifying the cabs, one, two, three cabs, we talked about them as time units of cooperations mm. or tucks. So if you're, <laughs> if you like uh, tucks, then, then you might say, well, I just need, I just want my, my daughter to just be able to play by herself for like five minutes. Okay, that's cool. First, let's talk about the B. The behavior is play by yourself. So there's, there's so many ways in which we can define that, encourage that, prompt that, reinforce that. Like those are the important parts. But we might, it might be that rather than uh, escalate from cab two to cab six by saying play with one toy and up to play with 10 toys, you're just saying I want you to play with this one toy for five seconds up to three minutes. So, so it's, it's the same process, it's the same yep. procedure, but we're just talking about the, the response required to produce reinforcement is duration-based as opposed to, I don't know, uh, amount-based or whatever. That's perfect, and I just hope you are ready for that to be branded, because that's what's going to happen when we start putting it in the group. Tuck it in. Tuck. Tuck. Un untuck it. I don't know. We'll come up with something. I think, I think that's one, exam one good example, too, of uh, where the um, SBT and EFL kind of go together. So there's quite a few of these um, targets where I'm teaching using the SBT or my own programming, and then I'm using the EFL goal to as a milestone. So the EFL goal for for uh, tolerating wearing a mask. So I have a learner who's doing that and we're doing it um, with uh, how many um, uh, mastered preferable task completion activities can he do while he's wearing the mask. And at first we started with one activity with a few pieces and multiple pieces, right? So it's essentially the SBT process. We put the mask on and then can he do it? But in, um, but we're not tracking it as an SBT thing. We're not teaching him to ask for the mask off because we just want him to tolerate wearing the mask. So we're using the EFL goal to track that and it's tracking it in duration, but we're not doing time when we're doing, when we're actually having him put the mask on, we're doing it by the toys and the number of toys and how many pieces they have. And then in the EFL, I'm gonna see, okay, how many, yeah, he, he kept that on for one minute today but mm. the tech isn't thinking about it in that way. She's thinking about, can he play with so many preferable activities that have a beginning and end that's fairly clear to him while wearing the mask? So, um, and I do that for quite a few of those kind of things where I have it in the EFL, but we, we can't just target it that way. We've got to build up some that skill in uh, with more quantifiable steps. That's an excellent way to do it. I also have some learners though, where the mask itself is just such a powerful EO that asking them to do anything else that is not preferred can be really challenging. So I think this is like a deep dive into cab building, right? Like how do we do this in a variety of ways for the types of learners that we work with? Because it's going to be so different. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But I mean, even, even the simple reconceptualization of a mask as a time-based thing versus a, a, a behavior-based thing lets you think about, well, if the mask is challenging, are there ways that I can break down the behavior of approaching the mask and putting on the mask? That can be broken down to a hundred different steps, yep. all of which can, that can be prompted, reinforced, and what have you. So, so I do think that it's, it, again, it's just, it's just the mindset set shift of always putting, always thinking about what, what behavior do we expect uh, from these kids? And I think that it, it pervades all of those kind of categories that you had in there that were, that were worth separating out, I think. What, uh, what does Tuck stand for again? T say it one more time. Uh, time unit of cooperation. Love it. Branded. 
<laughs> cabs are yeah. here. The cabs are here. Let's talk. And I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll credit you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Well, we've been on for much longer than we had originally planned. This has been absolutely amazing and just rich in information. It's going to be um, put on the, the group probably today or tomorrow. So keep your eye out for that. But I just want to say a huge thank you to Ditch You and Emily and Megan for coming and adding their expertise. This has been incredible. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, you so you. much. Thank you so much. Yeah. I so appreciate everything. Also, Hillary and Ed. Also, thanks to you guys. Absolutely. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Happy Year. Happy New Year. Tuck it in. Tuck it in. <laughs> <laughs> That's my New Year's resolution. I want to be able to tuck in some shirts that I haven't been able to for a while. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. So, Cheers, everyone. Bye -bye. Cheers. Aw. <laughs> Cute baby. <laughs> All right. Bye. Oh.